And since people are still trickling in, I'm going to give it a couple minutes and uh, wait for folks to join in as we uh, get started. I'm going to pull a Pontus from yesterday and get a scarf. <laughs> I have that so, Swedish European look. I, I may do the same at some point. We had snow here yesterday. So. Uh oh, we got a scarf off going. Pontus came in as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm in a cold basement, so I started the radiators this morning. Uh. <laughs> Pontus, I like that you've brought scarves into men's fashion. Thank you. Well, it's all European, isn't it, Abby? Kirby, you need to visit Europe more often. <laughs> I, yes, I do. I agree with that. They don't let us in right now. We're banned. Right. We have cooties, like literally. Those Just a quick reminder to folks as we're getting set up, if you wouldn't mind, please make sure that you're muted if you're not speaking. Thank you. All righty, uh, let's kick things into gear. I want to do things a little bit differently during this brief time that we have together at the very beginning. And I'm going to ask all of you who are uh, either students or early career to uh, go to the uh, Zoom tools and raise your hand. One of the things you'll see as you, uh, if you actually have the participant window open is that the uh, raised hands rise up to the top, which is a really cool um, uh, feature if you're in charge of watching to see who's asking which questions. <laughs> um, uh, I was really pleased yesterday by the back and forth in the sessions that I was in, in terms of questioning some of the assumptions that we as a study team have made and the, um, uh, the input in a very constructive way that, that came in to, uh, to the discussion in terms of definition of terms and um, uh, some descoping or baseline mission planning uh, definitions that were made and so forth. Um, uh, and, and that was really, really, Great to see. Um, what I want to do, though, is I want to allow those folks who are in these in this early career part of uh, the group. I'd like to hear from you during the next few minutes. Just take a minute, if you will, to speak up and uh, and share with us your thoughts over the last couple of days. Who wants to go first? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and just speak up. I'll go first since everyone seems to be pretty silent. Hi, I'm Alice Kikoris. Um, I'm, a, I'm a physicist at APL. I really enjoyed the workshop so far. I think one of the things that I've found to be most exciting is to see the wide range of international participation enabled by a virtual workshop. So I'm really excited to see people from outside the US participating and, and being a part of it. So I think that's been one of the coolest things I've seen so far. Thank you, Alice. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so I'm Sanjay from University of Pisa in Italy. So um, what's been more exciting from the last two days is that uh, this mission is uh, like another Apollo mission where we have new challenges, uh, new signs to be discovered uh, in the outer solar system and uh, new technical challenges that pose uh, to improve on New Horizons and 
Voyager missions that has already happened, and uh, I'm very very excited to 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 take part in technically as well as uh, also learn more about science. Great, I'm very glad that you're here. Thank you. I'll dive in here. I'm Kirby Runyon, and I'm a planetary geologist at Johns Hopkins APL, and the lead for the planetary science. Uh, part of this mission concept. And as an early career person, you know, working on missions and mission concepts is exactly what I wanted my, my career to be about when I was in grad school. Um, I got a degree in planetary geology, but I really wanted to use that to help shape the missions of the future. Um, I started to cut my teeth on, on the similar aspects of this. Alan Stern was kind enough to onboard me onto New Horizons back at the Pluto flyby. And I feel that that's put me in good stead to uh, help out on this mission. And uh, or this mission concept rather. And uh, it's so exciting and I'm so glad to share the passion and the joy of exploration with so many people who can participate in this virtual workshop. So I'm really glad that a lot of my fellow early career people are able to join in uh, at kind of the ground floor of this really uh, innovative and exciting um, uh, mission that will, you know, that's gonna, re that's gonna not just rewrite textbooks, but write them in the first place. Thank you, Kirby. I'll say a few words while uh, other people are still thinking. Uh, I'm Elena Provornikova. I'm a space physicist from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, and I'm, uh, I'm leading the heliophysics and interstellar medium science uh, for this mission. And um, I also would like to share my excitement about the last two days and about this concept study. I think it's, it's really amazing, for me especially, uh, it's really amazing to see how we go through all these aspects, you know, from, from the scientific ideas, from thoughts, from, you know, to, to implementation, to all the engineering details and to the, how we actually going to answer our questions. And it's really amazing to see how this shaping up and uh, to see all the participation uh, across all ages, countries, um, you know, it's, it's really fantastic. And I just want to thank everybody who actively participated in sessions and asking questions and sharing ideas. That's really amazing to see. Thanks, Elena. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the science and engineering culture that we live in necessarily uh, looks to experience and leadership leave um, it uh, let's go and um uh we we need that and but we also need the younger voices to uh to bring in their creativity their energy and to become leaders and uh and so every every year that we've met and as we've run this 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 study team we we keep looking towards ways to to strengthen the community not only through bringing on some of the the, the best and most experienced minds, but eager and and growing minds to make this mission last. And it's gonna last. Um, 50 years of flight as the plan is a challenge to even, to even think about, to plan. Um, and I really am glad you all uh, came and hope that you invite and bring more folks from the, uh, the early set, if you will, um, as, we, as we keep plowing forward through this. All righty. Um, uh, Today we have again some uh, some parallel tracking. Uh, enjoy yourselves. Speak up. Ask questions, and um, uh, and and just keep plowing forward with this. I'm really really pleased that so many people are already here on uh, on Wednesday morning, day three of this. Um, participation has been strong, continues to be strong, and um, uh, and I'm going to put my my email here in the chat for everybody. Um, over the course of the day, the next few days, and afterwards. Uh, there are many people that you know on the on the study team already, but uh, but I am I am I'm the study manager, and uh, if you have questions that uh, that you want to send to me, you're more than welcome to. Um, and so uh, with that, 
Um, I want to just give one last reminder to all the session chairs today to make sure that recordings happen. Um, in, my chair, in my session yesterday, um, Elena very kindly reminded me that I hadn't started the recording about a minute and a half into it. So we got pretty much everything that was in there. Um, uh, but we definitely have to make sure we keep these things, uh, the, the logistics of this going. So please make sure you're recording. And, um, uh, and finally, do please, uh, to all the people who are organized or running the sessions throughout the day, remember to, to try to keep people on time and on track so that we can give folks breaks in between, chances to get up, to move around, and to take care of other business as well, because I know that all of you um, have other business besides being here with us. So thank you. And with that, um, uh, why don't we go ahead and um, adjourn the, uh, the, the kickoff for the day. This is room one where the mission trajectory and, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, uh, where, the, where, the, where the mission design and trajectory discussion is going to happen. Um, room two, room two happens in, um, uh, in parallel, oh, wait a minute. No, we're all, are we all staying here? All staying here. We're all staying here. Oh, so with that, the last I will. Of the day is parallel. Hey, Michael, the last session of the day is parallel, but other than last that, session, not the first sessions. My, my apologies. I've misread the, uh, the schedule as we had it set up today. With that, I'm going to shut up, <laughs> turn it over to Jim, um, who's going to, uh, who's going to be our chair for this session. Great. Thanks. So uh, we are talking about mission design and uh, uh, trajectories, and we may even touch on a few other minor topics as well. Um, our presenter today is going to be Wayne Schley, which I think most people, or many people do know. Um, Wayne has worked on a number of these missions uh, for mission design kinds of aspects. Um, in particular, he's been with New Horizons, uh, working with the Arakoth flyby, and he's been with this study for quite a while as well. And I think some of you may have heard him present some of this material already. Uh, I don't want to take too much of his time, but it, a couple of reminders. Um, Wayne does have a lot of material we'd like to get through. And so while we, we want to have questions, no question about it, we want to have discussion, um, but we want to do it in an organized way if we can. So if there's something you want to ask, um, please raise your hand in the, in the chat, in the um, participants window. And I'm keeping an eye on that. So we'll try to, to then be able to break in. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat. Uh, and then we can come back to those at, at the end of Wayne's material, or we can try to break in in the middle um, if it's something that really needs to be asked. Uh, and I just also want to remind you about our Google Doc. Um, feel free to record questions, comments, suggestions, anything that is relevant there. Um, I put a link in the chat window so folks can just click on that and go right to that Google Doc. And um, we'll be following up with all those things after, after the workshop is over, um, especially. Uh, so with that, Wayne, I want to go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and share. All right. Um, and again, again, if you're not speaking, then let's uh, make sure that we're muted. All right, let's confirm that. Am I sharing yep. correctly? We see your slides and they look good. All right, thank you. Thank you everybody for uh, coming to this talk. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch base with you today about um, creating a, a heliophysics based concept and a, a representative concept for what interstellar probe would be. Uh, this is intended to just be notional to set up uh, designs for uh, what could could be in a tentative time frame. Um, the, go the goal, of course, is though to create a pragmatic approach. So we, we try to stick to pragmatic, capable technologies that we will have available to us um, in a projected 2030 time frame so that we can launch in 2030. And um, our example window will be 2030 to 2042. And you'll see that as we come go through the, the slides. All right, so, and um, again, I'm Wayne Schley. I'm a mission designer here at APL. So this was my uh, task to try to look at this uh, concept uh, generation. So for interstellar probe, the goal for heliophysics in particular was to obviously study the heliosphere. What, what's the shape? Um, what, what, is, what does it appear like in the sky? Um, and then also investigate the uh, nearby interstellar medium. And technically this would probably be more classified as the very local interstellar medium. Um, and also we wanna investigate that solar interaction. So how does, how does the heliosphere actually interact with it? So uh, we can kind of describe this in terms of some heliophysics objectives, some notional heliophysics objectives for trajectory selection. Um, I'll go through these here in a second, but what I want to point out first is here on the right is a representative picture of the sky and some of the, the geometry that we expect to see. Um, uh, just to confirm, can everybody see my, my mouse? 
question? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so the, uh, what you see here is the ecliptic J2000 projection of, of the sky. The heliosphere nose is uh, here at seven degrees north and 252 degrees east. The tail is then 180 degrees opposite of it. Uh, what you see in terms of contours here is the um, uh, 1.1 kilo electron volt ENA flux uh, as reported by IBEX. So this is actually an indication of, of the, the colored contours or where this IBEX ribbon is in the sky. And that's also a, a very interesting uh, topic that, that is very exciting for heliophysics to try to investigate. Um, you'll also see a, a variety of different objects, uh, lots of KBOs, a few stars, um, but you'll also see Voyager 1 here above, Voyager 2 down here, and then New Horizons, where they are in the sky in relation to the nose in particular. This is just a, a, to give you a geometric picture of, of what's out there at the moment. So what we want to do for at least notional heliophysics, the first goal is basically try to get as far as we can, as fast as we can. Try to get to the nearby interstellar medium ASAP. Uh, this is basically saying we want to try to reach 100 to 120 AUs at the fastest speed possible. Um, and that's with pragmatic technology. We also want to make sure that we have a, a, a mission complete within 50 years so we can actually achieve all of our science objectives within a, a 50 year design lifetime. And uh, it should be noted that our top speeds are based on uh, geometric alignment, in particular where Jupiter is in the sky. Uh, you'll see where those are here as we go through this presentation, but that's part of the drivers and selection process that we'll investigate. The other goal, another goal is to, notional goal I should add, is to take a side view of this heliosphere to get a good shape understanding. And as Pontus pointed out in previous presentations, a good place to go is about 45 degrees off the nose. We can, we can still have a, a shorter distance so we can still reach, reach the interstellar medium in a roughly the same speed as going through the nose, uh, maybe a little, slow, a little bit longer, I mean. But uh, we can get that side picture. So I will tentatively represent 45 degrees off the nose with a purple band like you see here. And then the final objective, uh, notional objective, I should add, is fly through this IVEX ribbon and take in situ measurements to try to characterize this information. Secondary goals, and these are mainly for augmentations to this, is to also intersect a, a KBO for some planetary science. So what I've listed here in terms of uh, pictures, or in terms of pathways, sorry, is the, the uh, 30 largest KBOs. Um, so these are typically speaking the highest interest, highest value targets. Now the pathway arcs that you see are from 2030 to 2042. And I've added a few other objects in here for um, additional flavor. And these are particularly the Neptune and Uranus uh, Trojans and Centaurs. Um, and I put those in there because these are possibly things that we could actually uh, intersect on the way out uh, while we're trying to head towards a KBO um, and in particular the actual like the interstellar medium. Okay, so uh, one thing that I should note with interstellar probe is it's actually a very unique des mission design problem. Typically when we work through these problems from a trajectory design perspective, we already know the destination. We know we want to go to Mars. We know Dragonfly wants to go to Titan. So we actually will design missions and trajectories that minimize the C3 so we can get the largest mass to a particular target. After we do that minimization, then we do a launch vehicle selection to try to get the biggest mass that we could possibly get uh, towards, towards that objective. Now in Interstellar Probe's case, we actually want to figure out what's the best destination possible, but we also know from our notional objectives that we want to go as fast as possible. So in essence, we need the highest C3 we can get. Um, which means, conversely, we need the, the best launch vehicle available, which will be the SLS Block 2. Um, in, in the 2030 timeframe, uh, there will be some flights that already exist and SLS will be proven at that time. So we believe that 
SLS block two is going to be our best option for achieving these objectives. But what we need to do though is, is kind of do a back solve problem. We, we have to pick C3s and masses such that we can actually figure out where are the best destinations, where are the best speeds. And so that's what we tried to accomplish with this, with this task. Okay, so just to give some nomenclature about what these trajectories are gonna be, uh, we have split the architecture pathways up into three viable options that we wanna investigate. Option one is gonna be our ballistic Jupiter gravity assist. So what we wanna do is use as much C3 as possible, use a four stage SLS block two, and go to Jupiter as fast as possible, do a low altitude flyby, to get as much of a gravity assist as we can and get the biggest speed we can to leave the solar system. Option two is doing a power Jupiter gravity assist. So we do three stages for launch, take that four stage with us to Jupiter and then burn it at Jupiter to increase our bend or, or increase our energy and get more, more speed out of the system, hopefully. And then we also have option three, which is the solar birth maneuver. You launch to Jupiter, Jupiter swings you back towards, towards the sun, lowers your perihelion, you do a big burn at perihelion, and you leave the solar system. Our focus is going to be on option one and two, and particular variants in this case. So I've indicated that we have variant A, which is focused solely on heliophysics objectives, and then there's a variant B, which is heliophysics focused with a KBO flyby tacked on. So what we wanna do with the, we really wanna focus on these A variants here for option one and two. And we wanna study these destinations, what are our escape speeds and what is a, like a mission con op so we can put some, trade, some trades together to figure out what are our best options for, for interstellar probe. So again, we're gonna be focused on 1A and 2A uh, but we'll do some touch-ups and discussion on what 1B and 2B might be. All right, so as I said, we want to use the SLS Block 2 uh, to get our highest C3 available. Uh, one thing we know almost from the start is we do know that our spacecraft range is likely going to be somewhere around New Horizons up to maybe a thousand kilograms. So these kind of like already start to box the, the size and, and and speed and C3 available. So if we want to use option one, uh, this, this little blue box here represents what we can actually achieve uh, with that amount of payload mass. So we can get C3s from 300 to 350 or so. And if we look at these launch curves, uh, nicely provided by Rob Stowe and his uh, colleagues over at Marshall Space Flight Center. So thank you, Rob. Um, we can actually indicate like what is our best possible mass we can achieve and what is our best possible C3 based on a combination. And it's pretty clear that from these dotted lines, um, we're going to be focused on the SLS, the, the red line, the SLS block two, an Atlas V Centaur upper stage and a star 48 BV. That's actually the, the highest curve that we can actually see. And similarly for option two, since we have to take a star 48 with us, we have to change this mass range a little bit. So uh, we can actually look at where does this 2300 kilograms mixed with this thousand up to a thousand kilograms move us along this chart. And this is over here then on the upper left in the purple box. Now in this case, we can't do the four stage options. So none of the dotted lines are available. We have to stick to the solid lines. But in that, it's pretty clear that the red curve with the centaur uh, third stage is still also what we want to use. So again, we want to try to focus on what's our best launch vehicle combination for best speed possible. This is going to be SLS Block 2 plus an Atlas V Centaur and a Star 48 BV for option one. And we just remove the Star 48 BV to the third, to the powered option for the option two. So these are our launch vehicle uh, selections uh, for this particular mission set. With that, we can actually characterize a given mass to a C3, and then we can start looking at some trajectory options. So in order to find that destination, what we want to do is to start mapping these possibilities out uh, over the whole sky. And in order to do that, we're actually going to just try to look at 
what is possible. And we're going to try to evaluate the capabilities. It's nice enough that since we know that we're going to do go direct to Jupiter and then do a flyby and, and leave, that's simple enough that we can actually do a brute force evaluation. So what do I mean by that? When we look at these um, interfaces with regard to Earth to Jupiter legs, we like to look at these uh, possible curves in terms of what is known as a pork chop plot in mission design circles. Uh, we call it that because it looks like a pork chop. Um, so uh, what we usually plot is a launch time on the x-axis and arrival time at uh, Jupiter in this case on the y-axis and we plot contours of constant C3. Um, so you'll see with the solid lines, uh, those are the, the C3 contours. Overlaid on this is also the V infinity at Jupiter, so the speed relative to Jupiter, uh, just for a context uh, and, and give you a little bit more piece of information. And that's relevant because typically what happens is the fastest post Jupiter speed is correlated with the highest V infinity arriving at Jupiter. So that means essentially that these, these dips on the contours are actually where your fastest possible speeds are. But since we are trying to investigate where we could possibly go, we don't wanna isolate ourselves to just that point. We wanna look at all these points or as many points as possible to see what's actually possible to go and how fast, we, how fast we actually are going when we get there. So uh, what we do is we actually isolate a, a fixed C3 contour, like this dark red line here. And this gives us a whole set of opportunities. We discretize that into, these, uh, into a, a set and we start evaluating how do these actually interact with Jupiter. So we propagate all of these solutions forward to Jupiter. Then at Jupiter, we do an evaluation of how do we actually perform the flyby. And this is simply a two parameter uh, insert grid, uh, two parameter uh, grid that we just brute force propagate more and more trajectories. So uh, to define how we do a flyby, you only need two parameters, and that's first the Jupiter uh, perigee, or sorry, periapsis, which we call perigove. That's the RP value. Um, and then the other value is the uh, angular value to determine the aim point. So that's the, the theta B, which is essentially the, the B plane angle, as we call it in mission design circles. These two parameters can actually determine how do I, how do I, what post flyby conditions I actually achieve. RP primarily focuses on the bend. Theta B focuses on the inclination change that Jupiter creates as I do the flyby. So as we propagate all three of these parameter spaces forward, we create a large set uh, of a point cloud as it approaches the sky. And so we do one more step to actually start characterizing this information in a broader sense. And what we do is we actually will, will bin on, the, on a grid of the sky, what is our max speed possible? So that creates like what you see here on this, on this final plot, this end result for a given launch year. You'll note that there are actually extreme high speeds in one particular area, these, these red zones, this island. Uh, I call this the hot zone uh, because this is where we're achieving the best possible speeds. You'll also note that Jupiter is strong enough to give us bend uh, so that we can reach almost all inclinations. It's just the, the difficulty is that uh, you actually start to lose speed as you use more and more inclination. Uh, so that's actually like a theta B that would correlate with um, 90 or, or 270 to kick you out of, out of the ecliptic plane. You'll also note that there's some white areas. These white areas are actually where you actually cannot achieve escape speed. Um, it's possible on a given year um, and a given set of, of potential trajectories. But um, this is only one year. So if we want to actually consider how do I you know, get really high speeds across the whole sky. What we start doing is amalgamating this, this plot with multiple launch years. So we actually consider the launch time frame that I talked about before, which is 2030 to 2042. That correlates with a, a complete Jupiter period and also with the, um, 
uh, with a potential decadal time frame that you might see uh, starting in 2030. And so that amalgamation appears as so. Uh, so this is a representative example uh, with the colors I'll start with um, that shows how a how the set of highest possible speeds varies over the sky over a given launch time frame of 12 years. So uh, 2030 starts here towards Pluto and then it starts to march eastward. So you see 2031 on the very edge over here, 2032 and so on um, as you get to nose areas around 2037 to 2041. Okay. Um, uh, what you also see on this uh, plot is more data because we're going to merge the speed objective with our other objectives to try to pick what are re really some really good locations to go. So you'll see first the uh, 45 degrees off nose band in purple. That's just a 10 degree band to give it some variance so we get a, a more tentative idea where to potentially go. Um, now again, 45 degrees is just a notional idea. Um, Marab noted yesterday that potentially going to the flanks is also really of interest. So that's at the 90 degree mark. And you'll see the 90 degrees at, with the green band uh, there as well. Okay, so the other piece of information is that IBEX ribbon. So the IBEX ribbon is actually overlaid with a black and white contour uh, with the same data set. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but basically the whiter areas are where you want to go for IBEX, for the IBEX ribbon. And so what we try to do is mix speed, 45 degrees off the nose, and the IBEX, the IBEX ribbon to find like what's a really good location to start, to start heading out of the solar system with regard to an interstellar probe trajectory. Now I'll note here with this plot, uh, this is actually correlated with a mass equivalent to New Horizons. We can already, we already were able to tell pretty quickly, especially because we had two RTGs and, and a very large uh, dish, um, that we were going to surpass that mass quantity. So we need to actually ramp up our, our mass and therefore reduce our C3 accordingly to, tr to try to account for an actual uh, mission profile that we want to achieve with regard to expected masses. So that's what you see here in this plot. So what we did is, is after some iterations on what mass possibilities were there, uh, we started to settle towards a option 1A mass of 860 kilograms. And that led towards this uh, particular representation of our speed map. Now note, as we increase the spacecraft mass, the zones are typically reduced and slightly shifted eastward. Okay, uh, so merging all these objectives, what we settled on for a notional study target was roughly zero degrees. So in the ecliptic, where typically our highest speeds are, and at 295 degrees east, which is towards where New Horizons is in the sky. It intersects the Ibex band um, close to the edge, but still in a location that we feel like we could get uh, reasonable science. And this correlates with uh, a launch in the end of 2040, beginning of 2041. So the reason why I tied those two together is because that's actually where uh, the, the pork chop plot indicates uh, a really good C3s um, that correlate with uh, the new year. So that's why you'll see those two merge together. Okay. Um, when, we, uh, when we look at this, we can have, instantly see that we actually have a, a particular hot zone intersection that gives us roughly a seven AU per year um, uh, speed possibility. And we'll actually highlight that further here in a bit. We can actually do the same process for the powered flyby, but we have to make two additional assumptions uh, in order to get that same bidding process to work. Now, uh, the, the main thing is, is that we have to focus the powered flyby, the, the powered maneuver has to occur at Jupiter uh, periapsis. So at perijove is when we do this flyby or this powered maneuver. And then we also make the assumption that it's either going to be a speed up. Uh, so like the figure here on the left, where we 
uh, increase the V infinity outgoing, but we decrease the bend. Or it'll be a break where we decrease the V infinity, but we increase the bend. Now, typically with our high speed cases, this is usually the max, the speed up is usually where we get the most max um, velocity after Jupiter flyby, but we consider both when we actually do this binning process. All right, so when we did that, we just basically always just take the max and we have a, a similar equivalent uh, powered flyby map, or well, sorry, a speed map for the powered flyby. Now, um, when we do this mass consideration for the power case, uh, we'll see here later that you actually have to increase the amount of, of spacecraft mass uh, to accommodate for some propellant needs. And we'll get, I'll touch on that later. But uh, the resulting mass is roughly 930 kilograms. This gives us C3 203.91 kilometers squared per second squared and an achieved delta V of about 2.79 kilometers per second using the star 48 BV at Jupiter. Comparatively, these hot zones are typically skinnier, taller, and shifted eastward a little bit uh, by about 15 degrees uh, compared to their, their ballistic uh, 1A equivalents. To do some uh, initial calculation, we'll continue to keep the same study target at zero degrees north and 295 degrees east. Um, but you'll note that this actually correlates to a spot that is somewhat in between hot zones. And we'll cover that. Uh, I'll touch on that again uh, here in a bit. Okay. So uh, now that we have some tentative ideas of where we want to go, uh, we need to actually start doing some refinement on the actual trajectories and, and get some mass trades and actually start developing the full concept. So the first thing that I wanted to indicate is, is when we do these refinement problems, we actually use an optimization procedure as opposed to a brute force grid search idea. So our optimization is basically, we want to maximize our outbound speed. And that's basically maximize your post Jupiter orbital energy with respect to the sun. In option one, um, we basically have to just focus on our launch date, Time, to Earth, time between Earth and Jupiter, and time from Jupiter to 1,000 A, or 100 AU, um, as well as the target as our variables in the problem. But we need to focus that, that target as a fixed, uh, a fixed destination, um, and we also need to force our C3 value to, to make sure that we're matching to what the SLS can do. Um, so these actually end up being our equality constraints in that type of problem. Uh, the power is very similar, but we just have to add one additional thing and that we need to add. Let's make sure that our delta V is also equivalent to what we expect out of the system. Now, uh, to note, just, just quickly, again, it is a different problem. We're not doing a brute force uh, forward search. We're actually doing a search via a, a root solve in between in the optimization in order to get the solution. So um, there is some numerical noise associated with that, but you really won't see much of that with what we have here. So uh, what we did is we took this optimization procedure and ran it uh, for our particular destination target to see how mass varies our, varies our actual outbound speed. So we took our notional target, zero degrees north, 295 east for option 1A, and we, created um, a, uh, a curve that represents how mass changes our outbound speed. And you see that in this black curve here um, that uh, Jim has actually showed earlier this week. So this is actually surprisingly very linear as we change, as we change 50 kilograms, add 50 kilograms to our potential wet mass for interstellar probe. This only relates to a drop in speed of about 0.17 AU per year. Roughly speaking, that is about two months of flight time to 100 AU. So in terms of the mass trades, it's actually not that detrimental to get to the um, heliopause quickly by adding 50 kilograms. Not terrible, but we still always want to keep our mass as low as possible so we can go as fast as possible. Okay. Um, 
this is a representation of the actual trajectory that we ended up uh, selecting. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention one thing. On our 860 kilogram option, we're going about 7.32 AU per year as a, as a final selection. Dwayne, this is Jim. If I could break in just a second. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Elena has asked a question that I think would be good for everyone to hear. Um, if you could go back to your, one of your sky maps. Yeah, I just wanted to, and I don't know that it's on this plot very easily to see, but I just want to make it clear to everyone that when you're looking at these red zones, each of these red zones corresponds to a particular launch year. It starts at 2030 over on the right-hand side of the plot, wraps around to back to 2040. Um, it's 2030 here. And it moves yep. rightward each year. Now, I'm sorry right. that the plotting is difficult sometimes. Ideally, it'd be black, but the blue is hard to see on black, so it, it, you get what you get. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the, the point here that, and I think Ralph is, has emphasized this in the chat as well, that I want everybody to pick up on is that when you pick a target, um, you're picking a launch year. It's not the other way around, right? Um, yep. So when the scientists say we want to go here, that really determines the launch year. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. Just want to make sure everybody understood that. Thank you, Jim. And thank you, Ralph, for pointing that out in the chat too. Okay. So um, as we selected that 2041 launch uh, for, for our option 1A target to 0295, this is a representation of the close-up of, of launch and then the pathway towards Jupiter as well as out of the out of the system, you'll see here that these these particular this particular time is a snapshot at the Jupiter flyby where Earth is, where Jupiter is, and where Saturn is just just for extra information. Um, so at the Jupiter flyby on the, on this one A trajectory, this is at zero point eight five years into the into the the trajectory the pathway. At that particular time. Uh, when we do the Jupiter flyby, we will actually have a conjunction. So uh, what I mean by that is Earth is behind the sun as with regards to this, the spacecraft and Jupiter. This is actually something that is, is sad to say hard to remove from the 1A possibilities. And that's primarily due to the time of flight from Earth to Jupiter. Um, typically, these are going to be three quarters of a year to 85% um, of a year. And so you'll, Earth will move 75 to 85% through its orbit. And so it'll always be on the opposite side of the sun from where you're, you're launching. This is, a, this is what's gonna happen when we use this 1A trajectory. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, we should also note that we're at 100 AU in 14 years. 120 AU in 17 years and 200 AU at 28 years into the flight. So our typical goal is to do a design of a 50 year flight time. And so 50 years for option 1A is going to get us in the neighborhood of 358 AU, not 1000 AU. Um, this is with, with the technology we have available to us with a pragmatic design. All right, so we can actually do the same thing for our option two trajectory. Now, um, I didn't mention this before, but on the right are sky map pictures of increasing mass. So you can see how the, the hot zones tend to vary as you go to different locations. The white dot is actually our target. Um, you'll see that the 2039 hot zone is in the middle, and then the 2040-41 hot zone is on the right. Now, with this target to zero north, 295 east, this is actually residing slightly in between a couple of these launch years in terms of hot zones. Um, it's still going to be a 2041 launch, but the result is a slightly slower speed than the 1A option. Um, the, the mass trade is still actually a very linear progression again with a very similar slope as the last one. Uh, 50 kilograms add to uh, equate to a, a loss of speed of about 0.17 AU per year. And our final chosen mass is 930 kilograms giving us 7.07 .07 AU per year to this particular target. Now 
one thing we might want to consider is, is if we're doing a power flyby, it should probably give us some sort of a faster speed. Um, so what we can do instead of aiming for that original 0 295 target is start looking at our geometry and our alignment and start thinking about an alternative target for 2A. Uh, you'll note here, I drew a white line through these, the figures on the right, as that 2039 hot zone is primarily aligned with that white line, equating towards 284 degrees east um, as a different longitude. Uh, to settle closer towards 45 degrees off the nose, we will actually, we could actually do a latitude reduction down to 12 degrees south, um, still going through Ibex, almost 45 degrees off the nose at 37 degrees. Um, but in this case, we can actually achieve a lot higher speed, 7.44 AU per year, uh, to go to that particular target. And so our idea was then, let's just go ahead and switch the target for 2A uh, to this 12 degrees south, 284 east. Okay, so this is a, a trajectory profile then of that particular pathway. And you'll note that our, our time to Jupiter is almost one year exactly. So our launch and Earth position, Earth is basically in the same position at Jupiter gravity assist. Mm -hmm. So we actually don't have that conjunction problem anymore. Uh, you'll note that it's only uh, roughly 13.8 years to 100 AU 26 years to 200, and then at 50 years in this case, it, we can actually achieve another 20 AU um, over that time frame. So we get to about 377 AU after 50 years. Um, one of the things we can note with this is since we have the same stack, uh, Atlas V Centaur and Star 48 on top of SLS Block 2, and now we have differing profiles in different years, we can actually potentially create the idea that we could have a prime option with 2A in 2039, and then we could have a backup option with 1A in 2041. Um, essentially what this leads towards is if we're gonna do this design, the idea of a backup needs to go to a different target, typically. Um, if you are allowed to do this mix and match of 2A and 1A, you could actually set this up too uh, as well. All right, um, so uh, the next thing we need to do is then characterize how much fuel we need to take with, or, uh, sorry, propellant we need to take with us. Um, and to do that, we, we're gonna look at uh, our most equivalent mission, which is New Horizons. It's the best analog for what we've, what we've done to this point and, and the same basic flight pathway as it were. Um, and we do that because we need to have some idea of our uh, statistical dispersion with regard to uh, this, this problem in order to create an idea of what kind of delta D we need. Now New Horizons uh, from uh, this paper originally indicated that, that the pre-launch estimate was gonna be 290 meters per second. When they actually filled the tanks, they had somewhat like 400 meters per second available to them at launch. Um, but the statistical, the statistical navigation 99% probability allotment is what we're really interested in for this particular case um, to, to ballpark our initial estimates. So we took New Horizons 80 meters per second with a smaller launch vehicle and we ramped it up to indicate a, uh, a margin and a scale up uh, to, to handle what would likely be more dispersion likely out of the SLS block two primarily because of the higher C3. Um, our similar TCM load will, will apply towards, towards post-Jupiter in terms of our, our B variant trajectories, um, but this is actually a, a very similar uh, profile towards what we want to apply. So this leads towards our, our mission architecture Delta V budgets. So obviously for option one, we have our 860 kilogram um, spacecraft in option two, we have our 930 kilogram spacecraft. We have to add a couple of things. So first we did our, our launch cleanup and Jupiter targeting ramped up uh, for our option one. That is when we do our largest C3. 
And then we have some spin and attitude uh, adjustment uh, created from our, our boom estimates. Um, so the ACS required for, for using our booms. And, and um, we apply our standard 25% margin to create um, a resulting delta V need of roughly 126 meters per second. We can do the same for the 2A. Um, now in the 2A, we have a slightly reduced C3 at launch, but whenever we do any sort of Jupiter targeting and TCMs along the way to Jupiter, we actually have to maneuver with the Star 48 attached to us. So we actually have to maneuver with an extra 2,300 kilograms attached. Uh, so our Delta V allotment is less, but the actual fuel allotment is more, the propellant allotment, sorry because we have to push a lot more mass around when we do these maneuvers. So the resulting delta B is less, but again, we have to bring more propellant with us, and therefore we, we ended up with a larger vehicle in, in the long run. Okay, so uh, these are actually good representative uh, A variants, and then to just to do the, the B variant to go to the KBO, we need some extra fuel for um, some three axis control, at least with the initial, initial designs that we were looking at. And then we also need to do some post Jupiter targeting TCMs. So we need, as we're heading from Jupiter towards the KBO, we need to make sure that we, we hit the K, you know, fly by the KBO the way we want based on uncertainty. Um, so we, we do need some additional allotment to handle that TCM targeting. Um, so this created a slightly larger Delta V allotment for both cases. Okay, so one thing I want to note here is that our um, Delta V budgets are actually direction independent. They are, they are very similar in profile at this estimation stage um, towards any, any mission we want to try to put, up, put together um, at this point. So again, they're, they're a lot like New Horizons, but they are uh, ramped up equivalently to try to handle these higher C3 cases. Okay. Um, so just some comparative timelines so that we can kind of see how these designs stack up together. Um, I've plotted here the 860 kilogram ballistic 1A option in green and then in blue, I've plotted a 930 kilogram equivalent um, launching in 2039 to this other target. We've also just, just for comparison, we've also added a 650 kilogram option uh, for 1A. Uh, and you can see that the powered option is actually getting further out faster even than the 650 kilogram equivalent, which is a lot smaller than what we uh, anticipated for our 1A option. Now you'll see with this horizontal line, this is our rough idea of a design life at 50 years. Um, and again, these don't reach 1,000 AU at 50 years. They reach 358 AU for 1A and 377, 380 AU for 2A. So that's just to keep that in mind with our potential equivalent options. The next thing we want to do is what is the actual creation of a launch period uh, do for us? So in the launch period case, we have to expand not just our ideal case, but expand it out, uh, expand it out to a uh, potential set of days to see what kind of trajectories we could do with a real life schedule. Uh, bad weather can usually cause this. Um, you know, you could, you could start at the opening of the window and you could be in the middle of a hurricane. So you, you couldn't necessarily want to launch in that time frame. Um, but you could postpone a little bit towards a standard, uh, standard schedule setup, um, uh, 21 days in this case. So with 1A, we did this optimization procedure again, uh, optimizing per day um, over a set uh, of 30 days in this case. And we can pretty easily define a standard window of 21 days around our ideal 1A launch time of, of early January, 2041. Um, and we can still achieve 7.1 AU per year throughout the entire window. 
Obviously the best times are at these peaks uh, where we're getting 7.32 AU per year, um, but, but we are actually achieving at least 7.1 AU per year uh, to that particular target over this uh, launch period. Now, when we did this, we fixed C3 at our SLS block two allotment that, that we can achieve. Uh, when we do the powered case and try that same thing, fix, fix C3 target, a particular target uh, per day, we get some variance. Um, so with the powered case, uh, this plot in the upper, upper left here is doing the same thing that we just did for the previous case. Um, and as you'll see, we got some 7.4 AU per year as we were expecting, but then we got some dips. Um, this was not particularly what we were hoping to see. So we tried some additional variants uh, with regard to C3 and with regard to target variability, at least in terms of letting the target move by up to a degree in the sky to see what we could actually achieve in terms of max possible speed. So when we fix C3, allow the target to vary, we got some interesting behavior, some seven fours. Um, and then when we did variable C3 with a fixed target, we didn't quite get to seven four. Uh, but when we did variable C3 with a variable target, we were actually getting seven four throughout the entire usable window. And so we decided to go with this option over here on the lower right. So when we, when we did this, it actually moved the target slightly further north uh, to 11 degrees instead of 12. Um, but we were able to get a 25-day uh, window in this case with roughly 7.44 AU per year um, uh, throughout the entire 25 days. Now you'll note, again, as I said, the C3 varies a little bit. So we have high C3s on the edges and then a slight dip in C3 uh, to about 194 kilometers squared per second squared in the middle. We always have to design these things to the worst C3 case. And this actually starts representing what we more normally see with regard to standard mission design, um, where we pick the best case and then work outward. Um, uh, to a bad C3, but our um, a high C3, I should say, not bad. Um, but in this case, we actually have our high C3 at the edges, and then we can actually achieve a, a slightly better speed here in the middle. Okay. Um, all right. So I've talked primarily about our uh, Jupiter gravity assist and our, our powered Jupiter gravity assist there are actually some alternative possibilities with regard to how we construct the mission. And maybe you're thinking of some as, as I'm going along here in the presentation. Um, one of which is, can we use the outer planets? Can we do a Jupiter gravity assist and then encounter something else? Um, uh, so that's like Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. So uh, first off, let's talk about Saturn. So there are options to do that. We can go to Jupiter first, do, uh, do our most of our gravity assist and then let Saturn, uh, let an encounter with Saturn even add maybe as something a little extra. But um, I should note that we found a few of these trajectories um, in, in 2036, 2037, 38, and 39. The best option is clearly 2037, uh, where you get the best alignment, where Jupiter does most of the push and then Saturn just gives you a little bit more. Um, and that's where we're getting, you know, a 7.9 AU per year on these tentative cases that are not quite the same as what we were looking at before. So just, just to keep in mind, this C3 is with a slightly different mass. Uh, we have to play some games sometimes in order to, to, to first get some solutions and then expand out from there. So, um, but in this case, it should be noted that these trajectories that include Saturn tend to go to the same spot in the sky. And that's primarily because of the Jupiter-Saturn alignment. Um, so when we actually consider that, where are these actually going and map them towards this sky map, uh, you can see that they actually tend to go mostly towards the nose and slightly inside of this 45 degree um, indication or this tentative goal, I mean. 
I would also state that because Saturn is the final flyby in the sequence, um, Saturn does not have a, as much of a push capability or kick capability as Jupiter does. So getting out of plane is a lot harder. Um, you have to align uh, correctly with Saturn and then Saturn can only push out of plane um, probably up to maxes of 10 to 15 degrees and not as much as 30 like you see in these Jupiter cases. Um, I'll also state that most of these cases are, are grouped together uh, towards the nose. So if we want to go towards the nose, that might be possible. Uh, if you want to go 45 degrees or 90 degrees off, it's probably not going to work. Um, but that's just, that's just some ideas of what could happen with regard to Saturn. Now, with regard to Neptune and Uranus, uh, you can actually see them on this sky map here. Neptune is here in green. Um, Uranus is, is a little bit further ahead in brown here. They're actually towards the tail in this time frame, So uh, we cannot use them to go towards the nose. We could use them to go towards the tail though, uh, but at least in terms of indication, it, it, it seems that in terms of it, faster speeds, sometimes it's not necessarily always the best option to do. Um, and the tail is not a particularly great direction with regard to heliophysics objectives. Um, however, if you want to just consider some games about where you could go and adding this KBO variant, um, there are options there. So uh, as I was saying, towards the tail with Uranus and Neptune, it's not particularly good for heliophysics all the time. It could be good though, if, if there were particular interest uh, in that. But uh, mostly towards the KBO variants though, there are a lot of interesting arcs that reside towards that tail. And here's one in particular that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, and Kirby and I have had a lot of conversations about this because this actually goes towards <coughs> Paris. Yeah. Sorry, was somebody saying something? Okay. Um, so, Eris is, is interesting because it's very far out of the plane, but it's actually crossing the plane. I'll just go back here one, one second. It's actually crossing the plane at a particularly good location with regard to high speed possibilities. Um, the highest speed option is in this 2032 time frame. And that is actually where um, Eris exists in the sky. So we actually have um, particularly fast pathway possibilities towards Eris uh, using this same sequence of events. And Neptune is actually basically on the way. So um, Eris in particular only crosses the plane every 200 years or so. So this is actually a unique opportunity um, that you could get to Eris in 13 years if you use the SLS block two, but we do get a pretty good outbound speed with that particular possibility because it's in the hot zone. Unfortunately though, it's towards the tail. So with regard to heliophysics, it may not be the best option always. Okay, uh, regarding heliophysics possibilities though, uh, one particular target of interest that resides near all of these things in the sky, the Ibex ribbon 45 degrees off the nose is Quayar. So uh, we've done some preliminary designs towards, towards Quayar and what we might be able to achieve. So the first option is uh, a ballistic 1A option. I guess in this case, it would be 1B because we're actually doing the KBO flyby uh, that would launch in 2030. So this is actually uh, uh, quite a bit earlier than the design options that we were doing before. You could get to Quayar in roughly six years and you would achieve some slower speed slightly uh, than the seven AU per year desires, um, but around 6.86 AU per year. This is 47 degrees off the nose and also interacting with the Ibex ribbon. Um, another option would be, well, why don't we just go towards the, the fastest speed possible um, in 2041? And so that represents the design here on the right. So this is an option 2B design launching in 2041, getting to Eris and under, or sorry, getting to Quayar in under six years. Um, 
And we're getting really high speeds. It lists eight here, but I should note that this is a slightly different mass. Again, we have to play some games first to get started and then work our way towards uh, the mass we want. Um, so we start with a really high speed. It's gonna be pretty high, uh, but it is off the nose um, quite a bit more. This is gonna end up being about 60 degrees off the nose. And we've now moved, we've transitioned out of the Ibex ribbon slightly. Um, so the question would become if we want to do these KBO variants, we want to make sure that we look for what's a good option in a particular space of the sky for heliophysics. Um, we can expand that space, you know, five degrees in, in both directions, say, uh, maybe even 10, maybe even 15. Um, but we have to we have to stay focused on what's near heliophysics and then search for something that is in that vicinity. Obviously, in the what I've been working with is only uh, the 30 biggest objects. Um, as Kirby has mentioned, there's 130 uh, dwarf planets that could be of interest and then many, many, many planetesimals as well. So there's, there's uh, a lot of future work to go there and I'll get to that here in a bit. Other alternatives. Um, so you might have thought, well, maybe we could use electric propulsion. Um, so, um, uh, uh, a paper, a study in 2006 actually indicated that uh, roughly one kilowatt of power is needed to, to do this type of, of mission where we're actually getting a lot of speed up. Um, um, unfortunately though, um, what I want to state is that this is actually slightly deemed infeasible for our 2030 option, our launch option. And why is that? Because one kilowatt of power is hard to create post-Jupiter. <laughs> um, you either need uh, some sort of onboard nuclear, um, nuclear electric propulsion um, because you're, you know, you're far away from the sun. Post-Jupiter, you can't create that much uh, solar electric power. So you have to rely on what you're bringing on board. So if you're doing nuclear, that's actually not, uh, that's a, roughly a TRL-3 at the moment. Um, we, we don't ex anticipate that to be an existing technology in 2030 just yet. Um, the other option would be maybe I could bring many, many, many RTGs with me, uh, but you need, you need four to six to create this one kilowatt of power. Um, and from what uh, Ralph was demonstrating at the beginning um, was that two RTGs seems feasible, three and beyond starts to, starts to push the envelope of, of cost um, and also availability. There's also a systems issue involved here in that if you are pointing the high gain antenna back towards earth, that's also the direction you need to thrust um, to increase speed. So getting those two pieces, pieces of, of tech to work together on the spacecraft could be quite an interesting systems challenge. Okay, another option might be solar sails. Um, the solar sail trajectory will work much like the O-Birth. You'll have to go in towards the sun first and then accelerate outward. Um, this was studied extensively by Carl Sauer in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, and he actually, this is a plot from his paper, which is essentially uh, a representation of characteristic acceleration uh, to time to reach 100 AU. Um, and uh, based on your, your minimums, heliocentric distance, so your minimum flyby distance. Right now, our option one and option two are roughly sitting at about 14 years to 100 AU. So in order for solar sails to really give us anything, we have to be below that green line. Um, however, current sail tech is roughly sitting 0 0.5 millimeters per second squared to 0 0.8. That is not even currently on the curve. Um, we can't even achieve these possibilities because we're not even up to up to that yet with our current tech. Um, sales coming down the pipe are theorized to be up to two millimeters per second squared. Um, that is probably going to be a best case scenario. Um, I don't anticipate them to actually achieve that. Probably more like one and a half is possibly feasible. Um, but even up to two, we still have to get pretty close, you know, we have to start getting close to the sun to make these make sense. Um, our box is pretty limited now to these set of curves. And so if we want to achieve faster and faster and faster speeds, 
um, with an already big spacecraft, um, you have to you have to also accommodate thermal protection if we start going below Venus at 0 0.8 AU per year. So um, this cost balance of extra mass doesn't seem to outweigh the speed gain, um, or it doesn't seem to accommodate the speed gain that we could potentially get. So we also feel like solar sail technology seems out of scope for, 20, for a 2030 launch as well. So that's just some uh, additional alternative structures and alternative architectures that might apply here if you had some thoughts about them uh, just to kind of describe it slightly. Wayne, this is Jim. I just wanted to, to mention we have 15 minutes left in the session. So uh, okay. I'm, I think I'm on my last two slides. So Great. Um, thanks. Um, so uh, just to uh, uh, conclude like towards where we're going and what needs to be done. The first thing we need to do is, is start indicating what exactly are some other constraints on the mission that apply. And one in particular are the Jupiter rings. Um, we've started to look at this problem. Um, we, we definitely know that there's, there's gaps involved with regard to these rings as, as you do this flyby. We know that you have to fly either below or above the rings. Uh, but we also know that there's uh, an inclination problem here. So necessarily flying directly through the ecliptic might not always be the best idea. Um, with regard to the rings, um, this will create little vertical gaps in our hot zones with regard to the distance, and then possibly horizontal gaps with regard to inclination. Uh, this needs to be further investigated, but um, we feel that if you have to transition one of these one of these trajectories towards that, you could actually uh, potentially fly really close to the rings uh, to uh, accommodate this kind of constraint. But this needs to be uh, completed towards the investigation as we go forward. I'll also say we need to continue to do this KBO uh, B variant uh, augmentation. We need to look more at these other uh, pieces of tech, or uh, sorry, other um, possibilities of other KBOs that exist in the problem. And then we need to start looking at the solar birth maneuver. Uh, we can do the same sky map procedure. It just takes a lot more math and approximation. We have to know how do we create a shield mass based on all of the parameters, mechanical and orbital, um, to come up with that uh, solution. And then finally, another piece of engineering that needs to really be looked at is our navigation and how does navigation impact that trajectory? How do you actually do the, the 50 to 100 AU and beyond navigation. And this also will place some uh, adjustments on, on actual mission costs. And this is what we want to try to continue to look at. All right, so that's my last slide. Thank you everybody for um, letting me just drone on about, about mission design and trajectory analysis. Um, uh, I'd be happy to start taking questions. I saw quite a few start popping up. Yeah, so we did have a, a number of questions in the chat, most of which I think we've gotten answers for. Um, there was one question from Jeff Landis um, asking if you've looked at a powered Venus flyby, so for instance, an Earth-Venus-Jupiter mission, um, and whether that would be a benefit or not. So let's take that one first, if we could. Yeah, so Earth-Venus-Jupiter. Um, the, the scary part about going to Venus is you have to add thermal protection. So that means we have to add more mass. Um, I, I... I believe that you could probably gain some stuff, but on the same token, we also didn't really want to spend time. Um, you have to go. You have to go down to Venus. It takes time to do that, uh, and then go back up to Jupiter. So we didn't want to try to uh, uh, waste time in the inner solar system. We were just trying to head towards the outer solar system as fast as possible. Uh, Wayne, could you actually expand on that? Um, if if we were to do such a thing, what's the order of years it would take to get to the Jupiter flyby part of that? So like the final, we're on our outbound trajectory now. How many years was uh, that? It, yeah, um, I have to pull it off the top of my head. Um, the uh, the guess would be that you would need at least a couple months to go to Venus, and then you would have to um, utilize at least probably an extra year of flight time is my guess uh, overall. At least an extra year. It might even be more. Before so you got to... Yeah, this is Ralph. Let me time. let me just let me just jump in. So the other thing, Wayne, I mean, you're going to to do uh, we're going to do a Venus flyby, and as a gravity assist, I'm probably going to need to have a deep space maneuver as well, right? Yeah. And so that's going to that's going to need to be up at my guess is probably a few hundred meters a second. That means you're going to have to have a custom stage. 
you've got to be able to move the move whatever you've got for the for the stack and things get and that's going to and by adding that you're going to lower the c3 at launch yep it starts getting real complicated in a hurry yeah um yeah mass is the primary thing so like either, whether you add a, a, a deep space maneuver and the thermal protection to go to venus um, that adds both mass options you lose c3 you lose speed um, you also lose time because uh, you have to go down first Again, I, I, I can't pull the number off the top of my head. My guess is you would at least spend an extra year trying to get to Jupiter. Now, there's, um, uh, and over the course of a 50-year mission, a year doesn't sound like a lot. Um, uh, but it's not just about the time, and it's not just about this extra mass. But uh, in the end, the actual extra increase in speed that you might get over the baseline that Wayne has been presenting is not so significant that we're going like, to reach the next star in 50 years. Yeah, it's it's a it's a marginal increase in speed, and um, Pontus can talk more, perhaps about um, uh, maybe not for today because there's a lot of other questions we want to give to Wayne. But um, Pontus could perhaps talk about the fact that um, we've kind of come to what we're thinking of as an optimal speed, both very fast, but also spending enough time in the boundary regions between inside and outside of the solar system to be scientifically valuable. And so, doing um, a lot to add risk, mass, cost to the mission to get a little bit more speed doesn't seem to make sense to us from a pragmatic perspective. But why don't we go on to some of these other questions that um, have been posed to Wayne. Right, so at this point, I think uh, folks have, have uh, put questions in the chat. Um, if there's someone who would like to expand on one of those questions or if you have a new question, now is a good time to go ahead and, and pop in. Uh, so just feel free to unmute and ask away. So I know Alan Stern asked a question, but then he had to go to a meeting. So uh, maybe I'll ask this as more for Jim. Um, he asked, there's a, a radiation issues. So if we consider those and uh, the cost of shielding versus distance from Terra Jove. Yep, right. So um, we've done some, some rough look at the, uh, the radiation environment associated with the, the, the trajectory that Wayne has, has shown you as the example. Um, it looks like that is on the order of 100 kilorad kind of an environment. Um, we don't consider that a particularly hard challenge for electronics. I mean, we're typically buying parts that will survive that environment anyway. <clears throat> so we don't think there's a strong driver here to, uh, to worry about extra shield mass, um, like you might consider a vault or something like that if you were spending lots of time um, around Europa or some of these other areas. Um, and so there is some flexibility there, and, and Alan does make a valid point that we may at some point uh, in the next phase, you know, should we go into a, a more uh, deep design look at the, the spacecraft? There's a, there's a trade there that could be looked at for shield mass versus uh, how close you go to Jupiter and whether maybe by having less mass for shielding um, and, but still being a little further away from Jupiter, there's a, you, know, you come out in a, in, in a wash or maybe even an improvement in speed. That's work to be done, um, easily could be done in a pre-phase A kind of a, uh, 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 context uh, rather than this, this study. Um, and, and again, as Michael says, this, those kinds of things are optimizations, but they're not going to make or break the mission. Um, this is not something that's uh, that's going to be um, an enabler in, in that sense. We've got a lot of flexibility here. Okay. Uh, anything else that anybody would like to ask? Uh, let's see. Okay, so I see from from Parisa, we have a question that says, if we choose the solar overth maneuver option, do we need to hide the long 50 meter antennas uh, behind the heat shield as well? Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we need to hide everything behind the heat shield. Um, we will, and, and it is probably also true for uh, the other missions as well. We will probably not deploy until after Jupiter for for most of these long booms and so forth. Um, there are lots of um, disadvantages, especially for, the, for very flexible wire antennas. Um, you don't want to try to have those deployed while we're also doing things like a, a, a powered or an unpowered, really, um, Jupiter gravity assist. So I think in any case, we would do that, right? Someone else want to jump in? I can jump in quickly. I think the, um, the scenario on the table here is that we wouldn't do the centrifugally deployed wire antennas until we after the, the gravity. Is, I mean, that's, that's, a, 
that's a risk consequence five in my mind. So we're not going there. Yep. Yeah, and even even beyond that, we can't be spinning while we still have that shield attached. We would need to be three axis all the way through Jupiter, then through the maneuver, and only after the maneuver would we be able to spin up after we've right. uh, jettisoned the shield and ballast right. and anything else that we brought with us. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. And this is, you know, we are starting to see some of the complications associated with the solar orbit maneuver and, and how we can execute it, right? Um, there have been a number of concepts about things like having a, a, a cylindrical shield and a rotating spacecraft, uh, a number of issues there with how you do things like um, keep RTTs cool, uh, how you, um, where you put star trackers and other instruments like that to be able to control the spacecraft, the thrusters even. Um, and so we're looking at a number of these kinds of configurations, but uh, you know, I just, just want to lay it out on the table for everybody from the very beginning that that is going to be very, very difficult uh, the concept to, 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 to come to. And there are a lot of things that are, that are going to really have the potential to knock it out of the running. All right, we've got another question from, uh, from Elena. It says, are there any history with previous missions how to avoid issues related to Jupiter rings? Yeah, so Wayne, you didn't talk much about the rings here. Um, yeah. And I know you've done some work on that. So if you want to give us a summary of that, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, history related to Jupiter rings. Um, Juno, well, first, we'll, I guess I'll, I'll state that uh, Juno kind of classified um, uh, the actual like perigeo of distance that it could go. It went to about 1.04 and we're aiming for a minimum point at 1.05. So we, we got a little bit better than that. Um, there, the missions that have Classify the rings is exactly what what data we use to demonstrate that information. Um, uh, the rings are still a um, uh, it's it's just a, a band ranging from 1.25 to 3.92, um, some varying distance along the way. Um, the question would be like, what kind of density? exists that you might be able to safely fly through them somewhere. Um, I don't think that necessarily is the easiest thing to quantify. It might actually just be easier to avoid them entirely. Um, most, most missions I don't even think has, have attempted to try to fly through the rings at all. So usually they try to go below if they can. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I, I mean, most, most missions will attempt to go as low to Jupiter as possible um, to avoid the rings, but also simultaneously to get the best, um, you know, insertion maneuver that they possibly can. You know, uh, the actual flyby distance and the O-Birth effect allows you to get the most energy change as you fly lower to the gravity well. Um, New Horizons, for example, did not go that close. They went 36 um, RJ uh, outside, well outside of the rings, because that's all they needed. They needed just a little kick to, to get towards Pluto. Um, they were flying well beyond, so they were pretty, pretty safe as well. Um, most missions don't even attempt to go toward them, I think. So Wayne, this is Ralph. I think that the, uh, I mean, sort of, sort of the follow-up on that, you've alluded to it on the slides, is that uh, you can go close, but of course, Ju uh, Juno was at a very highly inclined orbit. And yep. so really, really, really low inclinations are going to be an issue because you'd, you'd end up, you'd end up having to fly through them to get it to 1.05. But yeah, uh, I think as you notice, as you note on this, it's, uh, it's, it's a small inclination. So that's, I, again, that's, a, that's another thing that one can, one will have to look at, but it's, I think it's, so, I think it's more of a, just a, a detail, isn't it? Yeah, primarily it's a it's a detail that creates constraints on our flybys. Um, it'll morph our possibilities. Let's say one of our trajectories was already in what would have been a hot zone, uh, but now it's removed because we're in the gap. We would just have to shift it slightly to, to hit right to the corner or where that gap is. Um, so just a, another slight change in target. The destination is still in flux, hitting exactly 45 degrees off the nose is not necessarily like a constraint on the mission by any means. We, it's, a, it's a notional uh, general direction. Um, going a few degrees off of that, I don't, I don't think will be a problem. Okay. 
I think we have time for one more question. If someone would like to uh, jump in. I guess I have a question uh, that I think some of the folks in the room might have an answer. I'm sorry, um, uh, might also have, and it goes like this. Uh, Wayne, I know how much time and effort goes into getting to some level of certainty about it, one of those trajectories that you showed. Um, uh, there are folks in the room who may think, oh, I'd like to take the spacecraft in this direction or pass that object in the outer solar system. Um, uh, it's not very easy to go and just run this all over again, is it? To, to, to try to see how fast it would be to fly by, you know, this target in the outer solar system or that target. Um, could you expand right. a little bit on just what kind of effort it takes to get to this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, one of these sky maps, uh, when you want to run a different mass takes, uh, I guess I run, I usually run them simultaneously on different servers. So they, they take, uh, you know, a couple hours together. Um, but, but that's only the, the, the first layer of information that gives you the, the guess points of what could be possible. And then once you start refining, you have to indicate exact positions and start running your optimization procedure, making some tweaks, uh, that can, that can take a, a little bit of time to go find that. Um, and then of course, like once you expand to a full mission profile, that's even more time. So, um, yeah, it, it's fun to track down a few, uh, cases here and there, you know, what are the possibilities? Um, when you start adding, more bodies into the problem. Uh, the KBO, not as bad, but when you start adding, um, uh, you know, the, the Saturn flyby or, or Venus flyby as you were trying to find it, that actually adds a lot of complication because it's hard to find the right initial guess to make that work. And, and, that's, and that's why I believe the, the products that you have created, these, these, these heat maps of, of how fast and, and what the launch years and the Jupiter flyby times would be, are so important to, to the study. It, it gives us at least an idea of, of what kinds of speeds we could achieve no matter where we go. Um, yep. and, uh, and, and this speaks to the most recent comment in the, um, uh, in the chat. All of our trajectories, all of our mission considerations have gone past Jupiter because of the boost that we know it gets. Um, yeah. And from the beginning, I think Ralph, from day one, you and I said, after we fly by Jupiter, every single time we talked about what the mission would be, it was just always the part yeah. of the architecture. Yeah, that's correct. So it, it turns out that, you know, sort of, sort of at a zeroth level analysis, uh, going by Jupiter close gives you about an additional three AU per year for your overall speed out of the system. And so that, you know, that's a, that's a significant, that's a significant, Difference. I mean, we're we're talking about uh, we're talking about flyout speeds of like like uh, you know on the order of seven seven uh, to eight, and uh, three of that is because of the Jupiter flyby. So it's something worth keeping in attention. I mean, basically, if you put Voyager on top of an SLS, Voyager one on top of an SLS and you didn't do any planetary flybys, well then what you would end up with is about the speed of Voyager 1 right now. So the planetary flybys make a big difference. Big difference. Okay, so we are um, about five minutes away from the next session starting in Zoom Room 2, which you all can all find at the, um, at the website, but I will drop that in the chat here. Um, copy link. Um, if anybody wants to just pull it off of the chat, it is now listed there. You can copy that and paste it into a browser or you can go to the website and click on it. Um, but uh, thank you all for your comments, for the questions. This has been another lively session. Um, appreciate all of, the, uh, all, of the, all, the, all the energy you're bringing to this, everybody. Thank you very much. Very good. And I'll be the last one hanging out here so I can hit save. And I see Viral use the clap sign to applaud for Wayne. I'm gonna do the same. Thank you, Wayne. Great job. All right, thanks um, everybody. All righty. Take care. See you all in room two. See you all there.